So the problem wasn't in the tradition or the interpretation of the scribes and what they had come through with. The problem was when the doctrine finally hit them in the face and John was standing before them, they couldn't recognize it. They didn't see it. So there can be churches and there can be people who have all right theology and all right doctrine, and yet when the glory of the Lord shows up, they miss it. Some of us have great spiritual experiences, visions, dreams, prophetic words, and some and others, and others do not. But these experiences are not the substance of whether or not you're a follower of Christ. We shouldn't assume to understand what God wants us to do. But in fact, we should let him reveal it to us. People, consider your scriptures. Is this taken with the same weight and reverence as if the Lord had spoken? But they're not adhering. There's a difference between hearing and adhering. So many of us have it going into our ears, but it's not doing anything. See, the people that have a terror of God when he returns, it says they want to run into the rocks and the crevices and hide away from him because they know that their deeds are evil and they want to get away from him. Christians don't have to fear that judgment, the terror. Just to let you know, it's good to have our kids in with us in worship, um, just to, to start to learn what it is to, to honour and respect the ways of the Lord, but also just in communion to have them huddled with their families, uh, like in their houses, like in Egypt, um, when, they, when they took from the lamb and the... It's just in the same way, I just... Corporate worship with family is... It's so important. And, um, you know, the only reason we really want to quarter between them is because we want the teaching to come at a level that they can understand it. And... Um, yeah, and thanks be to Adam and the crew that get out there and, and do that with our children. All right, this week I was in my room or in our lounge room and in our lounge room we kind of have a like a, a timber cross, not as big as that, but a timber cross and it kind of just sits in the corner and it's got these little fairy lights on it. And I was reading through this, this passage and I was praying to the Lord to, to just help me understand I was late at night and just sitting on the floor in my usual spot. And as I'm, as I'm praying, what I usually ask for is when I'm reading scriptures, Lord, speak to me. I just kind of, it's one of the things that comes off my lips. And Lord, speak to me, Lord, speak to me. And all of a sudden, I hear this whisper. And I get this big tingle up my neck. And I'm like, oh, no. And all of a sudden, I'm real still and... I, my head turns, I've got my eyes closed, I've got my head turned, I open up my eyes and these eyes looking at me. And then it all made sense. One of my kids had woken up and said, Dad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that makes more sense. God wouldn't call me Dad. It's just my child. <laughs> but I can tell you in the whisper, my heart leapt and I was very attentive while I was trying to figure out what did I just hear? Who was I just listening to? This morning, we have Peter who beholds the glory of God in Jesus, but it's not until God speaks to him, and the main teaching of this whole thing is to listen, to have full attentiveness on God. We're going to get into that in a second. But what we've been doing, if you haven't been with us or you're new to church, we're doing sermon series as we go through the Gospel of Matthew. So we started at the start of this year in Matthew. We will end this year in Matthew, and we just go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we've been doing sermon series, and we've been doing from 16 to 18 a series on deconstructing traditions that the church has built up on the Word of God, but that have come to nullify the Word of God and then reconstructing what Jesus Christ actually taught. You see, the Pharisees had brought up these traditions and the Sadducees and the scribes, they'd brought up these traditions on the Word of God over a number of years and Jesus is having to systematically deconstruct them for the disciples to say, no, that's not how it's understood. And then the disciples have to retrain the way that they interpret and understand and live by the Word of God. Does this make sense? 
This morning, however, what we're going to see is that when it gets to the end of the story and they talk about the tradition of the scribes according to Elijah, Jesus isn't going to say that they're wrong. In fact, he's going to agree and say, yeah, Elijah is to come. So the problem wasn't in the tradition or the interpretation of the scribes and what they had come through with. The problem was when the doctrine finally hit them in the face and John was standing before them, they couldn't recognize it. They didn't see it. So there can be churches and there can be people who have all right theology and all right doctrine, and yet when the glory of the Lord shows up, they miss it. And that's what we're talking about today. So you have your sermon notes. You might have got those in the door. If you didn't, there's sermon notes up the back and Beryl will happily pass you some of those. I do suggest to you all, if you don't have a physical Bible, bring one to church or grab one up the back on the right-hand corner and just start to get to know the Word of God. If you don't have one you don't want to do that, use your phone, you can look to the slides. But what we're going to look at in the, in the notes and the big question that I have for you, and you'll see the main idea and the answer behind this, how do someone, how do we revere the glory of God? That's what we're talking about. Peter is going to see the glory of God. How do we revere, honour and respect the weight and the glory of God? And the main idea and answer is that we will revere it by following his word. Again, the major instruction in this piece is to listen. And it's not just to listen audibly go in your ear, which we'll look at. It's to adhere to it. And we'll look into this. Before we begin, let's pray and then move into the text. Father, I thank you for the witness of your saints. God, so often I, I feel like I come to the pulpit and I don't need to preach because the, the lips of those before have been faithful in worship and in prayer and encouragement. And so I just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you testify to the goodness of Christ in all your people. I pray that our time would be a sweet perfume and fragrance to you. Lord, would you humble us so that we come in a right spirit before you. Father, I know so many here do not want to play church. We don't want to muck around with your word. We want to honour you because we know the goodness and the love of you. So would you just break down any walls or barriers in our lives that are turned away from you and turn us back to the righteous paths. Turn us back to the glory of your face. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So read with me, chapter 17, verse 1. And Matthew starts the verse in a peculiar way. And he says, after six days. Now, that's a transitional phrase, and it's not normal for Matthew to talk like that. He doesn't normally put in, well, it was this many days until this happened, and it's this many days. He normally just jumps from story to story to story. And what this is showing us is that the preceding story that we had last week with Peter's confession and then Jesus saying, look, some of you will not pass until the Son of Man comes with his glory in the kingdom. And this verse are connected. Me and Steve talked back and forth quite a bit last week on the interpretation of chapter 16, verse 28, and what Jesus meant. But I'm led to be even more solidified that Jesus was talking about the transfiguration. Because it's just one story but what separates it is the chapters and numbers that we know weren't written in the original Bible. It's just to help us find the location of verses when we're talking about them. And so these stories are joined together and Jesus takes with him three men, Peter, James and John. Now James and John are brothers, that's the sons of Zebedee. And then there's Peter, Peter was a brother with Andrew and both lots of them were called by Christ on the Sea of Galilee as they were fishing. If you can remember the story, he comes along and he says to them, come with me, I'll make you fishers of men. And so Andrew and Peter follow, and then walking along a bit further, John and James, and they follow too. So we've got a bunch of tradies, three of them get to go up, 
Andrew, the brother of Peter, isn't with them. And normally what the scholars call these three guys is kind of the inner circle of the 12. They got to experience Christ in unique and different ways. Now they go up and they're by themselves, so God's handpicked them, these three, to go up. Now I don't know for you how that would work, but I can imagine if I was one of the ones that was selected to go up on the mountain versus the other nine, I'd be feeling pretty good about myself. (laughs) I think it would be easy to come down off that mountain and just think you're a little bit more of a disciple than the other nine. And we know that there was a bit of that shoulder rubbing going on. In fact, James and John will ask their mother later on, hey, can you, can you talk to Jesus and see if we can sit beside him when he comes into his kingdom? Because they wanted a place of importance. And it actually broke out into a big fight and all 12, 12 of them were squabbling over who's greater. So we know that that kind of stuff did happen. That's just the fleshly nature of ourselves. And I can also imagine that going the other way, if you weren't the one selected, that'd feel hard. I don't know about you, I'd probably feel a little jealous. If I was Andrew, I was like, well, why can Peter go and I can't go? <laughs> now, this isn't a point that I'm, is really in the text, but I just felt like it was necessary to say, brothers and sisters, each one of us has unique relationships with God. And they're not all exactly the same. Some are revealed much glory, some are revealed less, and Christ has just allowed it to be so for the time. Some of us have great spiritual experiences, visions, dreams, prophetic words, and some and others, and others do not. But these experiences are not the substance of whether or not you're a follower of Christ. Just because God chose these three and had a wonderful experience does not mean that the other nine we're no longer disciples. And so I just say that to calm some of you who kind of feel that inferiority that maybe I'm not as spiritual. Maybe I'm not as close. I'm lesser than those that have those things. The substance of your discipleship is in following him. Does this make sense? And the other way around for some of you that do have a lot of good experience from the Lord. It's not right to yoke people to have to have the same experiences as you. Because what it can do is make them feel further away from the Lord when they're not. It's just your relationship is different to the one that they experience. Does this make sense? Good. Verse 2. So they go up onto this high mountain. The mountain's debated by scholars. And they're by themselves, the four of them, and Jesus is transfigured. Now, to be transfigured, or the word, it just literally means transformed. I had to learn that this week because I'd never understood what transfigured means. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't change into somebody else or something like this, but he looked different in appearance to them. His, His face was shining like the sun. His clothes were gleaming white, and as we know, the angels' clothes gleamed white. It's, it's, the, it's the view of the heavenly meeting the earthly. His face shone like the sun, as I'm going to look at, because of the glory that was radiating out of him. So that's how he looked different, but it's the same Christ. But when we speak about what spiritually is taking place, how do we know? Well, we know what was spiritually taking place because Peter actually talks about the experience. If you have your Bibles, go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Just work backwards, Revelation, I think Jude, and then there's three Johns and there's a Peter. So 2 Peter chapter 1, and you're starting at verse 16. You can read it up on the top if we have it up there. And this is Peter talking about the experience that he had on the mountain with Christ. This is what he says, For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths. So the problem that he's talking about is there's false teachers in the church. They're saying, Jesus this, Jesus that. And he's like, look, I didn't make stuff up to you. I was with Christ. I knew him. I'm just telling you what he told me. But he's saying, I want to tell you about this experience I had. This isn't a myth. This took place. We didn't follow contrived myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ Instead, we were eyewitnesses 
of his majesty. Majesty is another word. We beheld his glory. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, from the heavenly, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mount. There's Peter recounting the story of what took place here in Matthew. And he's saying, we beheld, we saw with our eyes his majesty. We saw his glory. So what was taking place was the spiritual reality of who Jesus is was being seen before their very eyes, his divinity, his divine nature. They were standing in the glory. It was just the other day. Uh, Where's Kim? Is Kim in here? Where are you, mate? Shekinah. He has a daughter named Shekinah, and I finally understand. It's the presence. It's the light. It's the glory. It's beautiful. And so while they're, they're looking at this glorious light and goodness of God in Christ, or the goodness of Christ, go back now, Matthew All of a sudden, standing before them is Moses and Elijah, verse 3. And they appear to them talking with Christ. Now, Moses and Elijah are two great prophets of the Old Testament. Moses is normally attributed to being the greatest prophet, but then Jesus will come along and actually say, John is the greatest prophet of those born of men. But Moses is the prophet that brought the covenant of the law to the people. He's the one that established this connection between the people of God and God through the giving of the law. And Elijah was the prophet who was given the role of restoring God's people back to the covenant. So one brought the covenant, the other one was restoring. And both these men's work are being accomplished in John and the Son of Man and the Son of God who is in Christ Jesus. See, you see, Jesus brings a new covenant as we just read before in Luke, I believe. Jesus says, in my blood I establish a new covenant. He is the bringer of a new covenant and he is through who things are restored back to God and John was pointing to that restoration. Now there's a lot that could be said about this story and how it overlaps with a lot of different parts of the Old Testament, but I just want to bring out one for you. And it's in Exodus, so go to Exodus 34. In Exodus, what we have is Moses actually bringing, he brings down the Ten Commandments twice. If you remember, he goes the first time up to Mount Sinai, the people get up to no good, he comes back down, the tablets break. But the second time before he goes up, he goes to God and he says to God, God, I want to see your glory. I want to behold your goodness. And God says, I'll allow it. So he goes up onto the mountain, back up to Mount Sinai, verse 34, and come with me now to verse 29. And this is what happens with Moses. He receives the tablets, he receives the Ten Commandments. God has allowed his goodness to pass in front of Moses, and this is what it says happens. As Moses descended from Mount Sinai, so he's coming back down, with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, as he descended the mountain, he did not realize that the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him, but Moses called out to them, So Aaron and all the leaders of the community returned to him and Moses spoke to them. You see, being in the presence of God, Moses' face was shining. He used to have to wear a veil over his face. And it struck a fear into the people when they beheld Moses who had been beholding God. You see, Moses is like the moon in the sense of when he is in the radiance of God, He's reflecting the goodness of God. You know, the moon doesn't let off a source of light, it gets its light from the sun. But with Christ, it's different. He is not reflecting something off God, there is a radiance that is coming from him. He is the glory of God in his divine. Now, verse 4, and all this revelation that's unfolding, It's easy for us to see it in hindsight, but it appears that Peter struggles to recognize 
the weight of what's going on on top of that mountain. And in his response to what he is witnessing, he is misguided by the revelation that he beholds. Peter wants to put up some shelters. He wants to put up temporary lodging. Now, obviously, for Moses and Elijah who dwell in paradise with God Almighty, they they don't really need shelters on earth. Now, I imagine that God the Father in heaven was probably lovingly rubbing his forehead in frustration with Peter because he has to kind of cut him off mid-sentence because he's just not really coming to grips with what's going on. But before I get into that, I just want to put some application on the first point. There's a misunderstanding of Peter with what he's supposed to be doing up on that mountain. In fact, in Luke, it just says he kind of blurts something out because he's kind of afraid of what's going on. Peter right now is witnessing Jesus in his glory and in response to that goodness, what he wants to do is do something for God, but God doesn't want him to, to do it. Now, it's not out of a bad heart. It's a genuine heart in Peter. He wants to do it because he can see in Jesus, he's like, look, it is good for us to do this. But God has not brought, or Jesus has not brought Peter up on the mountain to build tents. And so for all the good intentions trying to do something for the Lord, he's got it wrong or he misunderstands. The practical application I want to give, and Kim already kind of touched on this, but we shouldn't assume to understand what God wants us to do. But in fact, we should let him reveal it to us. Brothers and sisters, God has revealed his glory to you in Christ. And if you believe in him by faith, you've been up in the holy mountain sorts. But in response to that glory that has been revealed, we must not assume what I need to be doing for God. But instead, it's the other way around God. What it is that you would have me do for you? What is the purpose of my being here? What is the purpose of of me beholding you. See, God does not just reveal himself, but he reveals why we are there. You know, there's no point of doing a bunch of random good stuff when Ephesians says all the good stuff is planned in advance for us to do. You know, the world will say, you know, just do your random act of kindness every day, blah, blah, blah. That's just worldly thought. Christ-like thought is actually what is the will of God to discern it, to know it, and to do it. And God's word says that it is pre-planned in advance for us to do. You know, some Christians run around so hectically just trying to do all this stuff for God and always wondering if they're doing the right thing. And they're doing it out of fear, they're doing it out of anxieties, not out of faith. Can we see the difference? God has a purpose for you and it's specific to the way that he created you. Point two, revering the glory of God. Go back now with me to verse five. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So you can see there, while he's still speaking, so Peter's still blabbing away what he should be doing and God has to step in halfway through and just, no, let's just put a stop to whatever you're trying to do. I don't know if you've ever been in the clouds in like an aeroplane or something and the sun's shining on it, but it's blinding. You can't really see anything. And that's kind of what's come around them. And then the voice of God, which I'm guessing it sounds like thunder because that's how it's shown in Scripture, bellows out, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And I imagine that it was loud and fearful because they fall down in terror on the ground. Why is Peter on the mountain? Why are they there? To learn reverence. To learn what it means to fear the Lord. To learn what it means to fear the words and the teachings of Christ. Peter has a confession on his lips, that's for sure. He just had it last week. And he is on the mountain witnessing the glory of the Son to learn to revere him to take him at his word. You think about it. He confesses Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Then Jesus says, well, here's how it's going to be. And Peter says, no, it's not. I imagine it was a hard week for Peter. He had Jesus rebuking him, calling him Satan and get behind me. And then a week later, he's got God yelling at him saying, just stop and listen. 
Doesn't mean Peter's not a disciple. Doesn't mean the Lord doesn't love him in all these little ways. But he needs to heed, to revere the word of God. Peter again acknowledged that in 2 Peter 1.17. He says, For he, Jesus, received glory and honour from God the Father when the voice came from him. God the Father honoured the Son, gave glory to the Son, so that Peter would learn reverence, to honour him. Brothers and sisters, answer us me truly. If God were to speak with you with a thunderous crack and a whip, like the hairs on the back of my neck stood up with just my little daughter speaking to me, would you not pay the utmost attention and give the highest gravity and weight to the words that were about to proceed out of the mouth of the Lord? I want you to consider on, on Mount Sinai, God speaks the words of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. He finishes the Ten Commandments, the Lord says, and it says in verse 18, all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the ram's horn and the mountain surrounded by smoke. They're witnessing the glory of God. They're hearing the word of the Lord. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And then they said, you speak to us and we'll listen. That's what they said to Moses, but don't let God speak to us or we're going to die. Can you imagine hearing the words of the Lord and thinking, I'm going to die if I continue listening to God? Moses responded to the people, don't be afraid for God has come to test you so that you will fear him and will not sin. God made a mighty display of his glory with his word so that the fear of the Lord would enter their hearts so that people would revere what he has spoken. Peter is on the mountain and it has been shown a mighty display of God's divine glory in Christ to revere. In Deuteronomy 18, you can go there if you want, I'm just going to read it briefly off my notes. Moses says this, The Lord your God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. You have requested from the Lord your God at Horeb that on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not continue to hear the voice of the Lord our God or see the great fire any longer so that we will not die. That's this request here. Then the Lord said to me, they've spoken well. I will raise up for them. It's not Moses, but I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command. I will hold accountable whoever does not listen to my words that he speaks in my name. God raised up a prophet from among his own people. Moses prophesied this, that he would speak the very words of God and whoever did not listen to him would be cut off from the people. People, consider your scriptures. Is this taken with the same weight and reverence as if the Lord had spoken? It's not generally, is it? Imagine the Lord God speaking to you with a thunderous crack from here. Would there be a difference? See, there's many that can open the scriptures and see the glory of Jesus, but do they revere that glory that they see? And you'll know it because they'll either abide in it or they won't. And the command of God is, listen. You know, if my children, I feel like I've said this numerous times. My wife will say something. My children remain where they are. And I say to my children, did you hear mum? And they say, yeah. And I'm like, well, I don't think you did. Because you're not doing what she told you to go and do. Now, audibly, they're hearing just fine. But they're not adhering. There's a difference between hearing and adhering. So many of us have it going into our ears, but it's not doing anything. 
Do we see this? Are you listening? God's not saying, hey, Peter, make sure you stick next to Jesus and just hear everything he says. He's already been doing that. Add here. How does someone revere the glory of God? How do we show our honor, respect to the glory revealed in Christ? They revere his glory by following his word. And that doesn't mean just the portions you like. That is why we must preach the whole counsel of God's witness. This is why Peter is on the mountain. This is what we are to learn from his experience. You know, after I got saved, I had a lot of zeal for God, wanted to do all this stuff. As you do, you get that big fiery burning chest. And for about four years, I felt like every attempt I tried to do things for God, it just kind of got snatched away from me. And I felt very disappointed. And I still believe to this day that the reason that that was happening was because I was trying to build shelters. Just trying to do something for God. And I think he was just saying, just learn from me. Would you just kind of shut up? Actually pick up your Bible and just learn from me first. Know who I am. Know what I have for you. And then go. You see, God doesn't need me to be the Savior. He doesn't need you to be the Savior. He's the Savior. He will do it in his timing. And he'll work his will out in you in his timing. It's no good me going about doing a bunch of good stuff if it's not God's stuff. We move then into point three. Traditions can understand the word of God, but they can still destroy the glory of God. So the tradition's right, as I said. So move with me now to verse seven. Jesus came up, touched them and said, get up, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. That's verse seven and eight. And it's really quite a, a beautiful picture because... Jesus is back to being in his human form, I guess, to say it that way. Look, I'm not going to say it exactly right. I'm guessing there's a more theological way to say that. But his face has gone back to normal. His clothes are back to normal. And he says, don't be afraid. Now, there's a difference here. We don't need to be in terror of God, even though he is big and mighty. Like, run away, I'm scared of him. But there is a fear that we are to have a respect, a reverence. Remember when Seb was little, he still remembers it, and it's close to my heart because of that. There was this storm passing through, he must have been about three years old, and it was huge. And we pushed the bed up against the window, he got me to jump into bed with him, he pushed it up against the window, and we're just watching the thunder roll in, and it's getting louder and louder and louder. And I just said to him, you know, the Bible says God's voice sounds like that. Scary, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, because he was already shaking. And I said, but in it, we know that God's our Father and he loves us. Big, huge and mighty, but compassionate for his people. And he still remembers that. There is a fear of God, true, to have a reverence, but not a terror See, the people that have a terror of God when he returns, it says they want to run into the rocks and the crevices and hide away from him because they know that their deeds are evil and they want to get away from him. But Christians don't have to fear that judgment, the terror. But the emphasis is that it is Christ alone who's there with them. Jesus, the very much the human-looking man, who within him is contained all the glory of God. How is it that everything is made by him and through him, in which all things are held together? And yet that's what they were witnessing. And they are sitting there face to face, or were sitting there face to face, just like Moses sat face to face with God. It's beautiful. The experience is over. They're coming back down the mountain in verse 9. And Jesus gives his first instruction that they must adhere. Don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. I imagine that would have been a hard one to keep. <laughs> I would have wanted to come down and be like, yo, guess what happened, boys? Boys. 
And it goes to show that not everything that God reveals to us needs to be publicised for everyone else because it's not always beneficial. And it would have been very unbeneficial for what Christ was doing because had they gotten Christ to be their Messiah that they wanted him to be, it would have been bad. And he wants to keep this identity hidden because he's not the Messiah who's going to do what they want. In fact, he needs to die, he needs to suffer, and then he needs to be raised back to life. What he doesn't need is a king, on, a crown on his head, a sword in his hand, and going off with all the religious zealots. What we do learn here is that Peter has learnt to respect Jesus' teaching. Because this is the second time that Jesus has told Peter, here is what the Messiah will do. And instead of a rebuttal off Peter, he receives it. Peter doesn't try to dismiss the teachings as he did six days ago, but accepts what Jesus preaches. And based on that, in verse 10, the disciples then go on to ask, this is where the tradition comes in, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And they get their tradition from the reading that we saw in Malachi 3, when Jeff did the prayer reflection, but it's also in Malachi 4, 5, as the last prophet, you'll find that, the book just before Matthew, chapter 4, verse 5, and it says, look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their father, fathers. Otherwise, I'm going to come and strike the land with a curse. For 400 years, this is the prophecy that they were left with, to remember the instructions of Moses, to follow the statutes and ordinances, and then to wait for Elijah to come. So they were waiting for someone to precede the Messiah. Now, it might have been hard for the disciples to see how John fit the bill. Because it said when Elijah come, he'd restore things, he'd make things better. It didn't really seem like all of Jerusalem was all better. Might have also been hard, we know in Matthew 11, he says that John is Elijah. But they must not have received that. So whatever it is, they're still confused. Well, who is the Elijah? If you're the Messiah, how come the Elijah, how come the preceding person hasn't come? The messenger of God. So the tradition is right, but they totally overlooked the reality that God had already brought it. And look at verse 11, back to 17. Jesus says, Elijah is coming and will restore everything. Now in the CSB, it reads kind of funky and it might read funky in yours, but as best as I could understand it from other translations and from the scholars, it's kind of an agreement with them. He says, yes, indeed, Elijah is coming or he is the one to come. He's affirming the thought. Yes, you're right. He is the one that comes and precedes the Messiah, verse 11. And then in 12, he's saying, but I tell you, he already came. So you're waiting for him. That was right for you to do. That's right doctrine. But they missed him because John has already been gone and he's now passed. But Jesus says in it, he says, look, he will restore everything. Elijah's coming and he will restore everything. That's why it was probably a bit confusing. Doesn't look like restoration in Jerusalem. What it looks like is a guy beheaded for trying to bring restoration to Jerusalem. So how did John the Baptist, who is the Elijah to come restore everything? Well, like Elijah, the prophet John calls God people to repent of their wickedness and return to God. John baptized for repentance of sin so that when Jesus came, they would put their hope in his forgiveness that he preached. And in doing so, he was restoring people back to God through the new covenant that was coming. You know, every time a sinner acknowledges his wickedness before the Lord, seeks the forgiveness of God and goes through the waters of baptism of repentance, John is still at work restoring repentance. Restoring people, sorry, back to the Lord. This is the divine way that God has given in which people are to come. 
John fulfilled his ministry and simultaneously it is still being ministered. You see, John did this. Christ and his disciples, they took it on. The church then took it on. In verse 12, but I tell you, Elijah has already come and they didn't recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him and in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer. So for Jesus, the waiting of Elijah is over. People didn't recognize his ministry in John and he was put to death. They killed the person who was bringing this glorious way of restoration. So imagine that. Imagine waiting for God for 400 years to do something and you got the doctrine all right and then when he comes along, you kill him. Why? Because you can't see the glory of God in his ministry. Right doctrine, but they still killed the glory of the way back to God. They didn't adhere. They didn't act on the doctrine. Actually, in Luke 7, it says the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they ignored God's will for their life when they didn't get baptized by John. Brothers and sisters, there are Christians today, and I pray that we are not them, who know God's word. They have all the right doctrine in the church, but they lack reverence and honor to his glory and because of this they destroy the glory of God believing all the right things because it's just a belief system what's the point of knowing all the Nicene Creed if it doesn't translate into anything you know and you normally see it in scoffing Christians that scoff I remember this one time coming out of a sermon and a pastor had just preached on sexual purity Sexual purity, the inside wedlock and how that works itself out and stuff like this. And I came out and I was with another person and I just said, well, you know, there's some stuff that needs to be corrected. Talking about my life, his life, so on. And it was just a scoff. He believed it all. But he was like, you can't really expect it to be like that, do you? What's the point of the word? What's the point of the preacher? If I just scoff off what God says, surely I don't have to do that. Christians will believe in God's word regarding him making them male and female, but then scoff off the idea that there's roles for them that God has planned. Christians will believe God's word that he started the church and scoff off the idea that it has to come with structure and authority. Christians will believe in correction and then scoff off the idea when someone brings it to them. Christians will believe that they're saved by faith and then scoff off the idea that that has to come through with confession, baptism and obedience. Really? Can you see how it's just an undermine, right doctrine, just, and there's nothing in it. There's no reverence, there's no honour. And Jesus knows this. He finishes his teaching on John the Baptist by referencing himself again in light of his own death and resurrection in the same way the Son of Man's going to suffer at their hands. They've been waiting for the Messiah. They got the doctrine, right? But they can't see the glory of God in him. They won't revere him. They won't respect him and so they will kill him. Do we see this, brothers and sisters? My last point that I want to bring, point four, religion, and I'm talking about the right thing, the thing that Jesus is constructing. Religion understands God's word and it magnifies Jesus' glory. You see, in verse six, uh, 13, sorry, then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Now they've rightly perceived who John is. John was the Elijah who had come to restore the work through repentance and baptism. You see, religion just doesn't understand. It does what it's taught. And this glorifies God. John's ministry of restoration to God through baptism and repentance was given to him by God and it was carried on and carried on and into the church. And we had to do the same. And it's not just to think and to know the same doctrines, but to do the things that God has called us to do. And in this way, we bring glory to God. And to not do these things would be to destroy 
his glory, no matter how my right we might have it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up here. I'll just tell one more little story. I spoke with a man recently, been in church, long time, knows everything, blah, blah, blah. Knows the Bible back to front. And as we got talking, I could just tell that there was something off. We're talking on the phone. And I just said, I think you need to actually confess that Christ is Lord. He goes, well, I've never done that before. Man, four, three years in a church and no confession off his lips. Knows it all, but won't bring it out. And so I led him through Romans 10, 9. If you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess, like the word's going to be on the mouth, he is Lord, you will be saved. And I just said, have you done that? No, I haven't done that. Do it. He didn't want to. There was just something in him that just opposed the idea. How is it that someone can oppose declaring Jesus as Lord, yet at the same time simultaneously say that they believe it? It doesn't make sense, does it? It's like wrong. It's like wrong. He did say it. He broke down and wept. And he said, I finally feel like I've found everything I've been searching for. He'd been a person searching for knowledge to bring transformation, but he knew knowledge in of itself, just having it up here, didn't do anything, and that's why he couldn't find anything in his life going the right way. I said, you have to act on it. You've got to believe, have faith. And we went through that. We went through some other stuff. Anyway, I hope that he comes soon. See, that's faith being worked out on the Word of God, not just knowing it. And with that, I want to finish with a call to the church in all the various ways. The elders and I will pray for you. The prayer deacons can come up in the front and pray for you. But you know, there are things in Scripture where it says things like, 1 John 1, 9, to confess your sins, to bring it off your lips, bring it out to the light, repent and turn. Then he can forgive you. He knows what you did, but he still tells you, confess it. Romans 10, what I just went through, confess Christ as Lord. Bring it off your lips, your faith. Romans 6, demonstrate your faith in the waters of baptism. There are many things like this. But to go, yeah, 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 they're right, and then not do them, it's irreverence. Can you see this? It's important that our life lines up with the faith that we say that we have. Otherwise, what are we doing? Let's pray. Lord, I feel like that was just a heavy word. And uh, it's for encouragement for your people. Father, I pray that you would bless the hearts of your people. Lord, to be able to look upon the wonders of your son, Jesus, who bled and died for them, to forgive them of their sins, to bring them back, to restore them to God Almighty. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that they would know, according to your mercies and your kindness and your grace, that they can come and have their sins washed away in the blood of Christ, Father, I thank you that you call people to yourself and that it is you who reveals Christ to them in their spirit. Lord, would you be with them and would you bless them? In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.